Hey, you like comics, right? I mean, if you listen to this podcast, I hope you love comics. Well, in case you've been underneath the bed sheets for over four months, you might not know that Ashley and I have written a comic book called Jupiter Jet about a 16-year-old girl with a jetpack in 1935 that's being published by Action Lab Entertainment. Issue number four comes out this week at your local comic book shop, and it's available digitally on comicsology.com. Ashley, what is issue four about? Well, Jupiter Jet's brother is captured, her home was burned, things are looking bad for her, and she only has one choice. Break into the police headquarters and face Praetor Pluto. Plus, there is part four of the origin of the jetpack backup, where Jupiter Jet's father makes a choice that will change everything in Olympic Heights. Yes, so if you've liked any of our story ideas, our pitches, our thoughts on this podcast, please go pick up our fourth issue of Jupiter Jet, available in comic stores and digitally on Comixology and Amazon.com on March 14th. Now to the lesson, super friends. In brightest day, in blackest night, no evil shall escape my sight. Let those who listen to Geek History Lessons Insight enjoy this episode about Green Lantern's Light. Hello and welcome to Geek History Lesson. I am Jason Emerald Enman. I am Ashley Victoria Robinson. Welcome to your Mind University because you have stumbled onto the podcast where we take one character, construct, or ring bearer from popular culture and teach you everything you need to know about them in about an hour. And today... We're finally talking about this guy. Yes, we're talking about Hal Jordan, what some would call the greatest Green Lantern, or he's called that in several of the storylines online. And we're talking about this because DC Comics is soon to release Green Lantern Earth One. It mm-hmm. is their hardcover series about Hal Jordan. It's being written, it's co writer artist Gabriel Hardman and co writer uh, Corinna Bechko, Bechko. I don't know how you say your last name, but they're, that is going to hit comic stores very soon. So we thought if there was any time to talk about Hal Jordan, it is now. Now, this episode was requested by a lot of Mind University students. It was requested by uh, James Steinberg and Tobias. That's his son. Ethan Isaiah Mackey, Jack Paul Roca, and at Dixon Bowley. And if I misread any of those names, it's because I'm terrible with names. I know it was also recommended by uh, Fredericton, New Brunswick's own Cameron, but I only, I'm i the one who updates this list, and I only updated about well, once a month, but I remember his tweet from Twitter, so shout out to you. I'm sorry, I don't remember your Twitter handle. You're a really nice guy. Cameron from Fredericton. Uh, blame Ashley. It's my fault. I'll own that, but I All do right. remember his tweet. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, I add him to the list, and hopefully I remember him. All right. Uh, let's move into the first section of our podcast about how Jordan, the 10 Cent Origin. Yes, the 10 Cent Origin is where Jason is going to go over all the creators, power sets, and everything you basically need to know about Hal Jordan in case you ever go to a uh, Lantern Core themed cocktail party and someone's like, hey, who is this first but actually the second Green Lantern? There ain't no party like an Oa, an Oa cocktail party. Yeah, hey. sure. Oh, I bet the Guardians are a good time. They are. They are. Of course, Hal Jordan is a DC Comics character. His first appearance was in Showcase number 22 in October of 1959. He's so old. He was created by John Broom and Gil Kane. His first, his, excuse me, his full name is Harold Hal Jordan. Uh, He, of course, is a human from Earth. His team affiliations have been the Green Lantern Corps and several different versions of the Justice League. He has had partnerships with Flash, Barry Allen, Green Arrow, Oliver Queen, Guy Gardner, Jon Stewart, Kyle Rayner, Kilowog, and Ganthet. His notable aliases have been Green Lantern, Pole Manning, Parallax, Spectre, and Highball, that is his codename when he is a pilot. And his abilities are he is a trained Air Force pilot, and when he wears the power rings, he can make generations of hard light constructs. He can fly, he can do force fields, he can basically make anything his mind can think of. Wow. There was... You don't sound enthused about <laughs> Hal Jordan at all. Uh, Should we just quit the episode right now, Ashley? No. no. Uh, Hal's great. 
And everyone tells me how great Hal is all the time. No, well, tell everybody how great the Meet Cute is. Uh, the Meet Cute is the part of the podcast that we stole from romantic comedy writing. Fun fact, Jason has a Green Lantern cup he's drinking out of. Yep, uh, with Hal Jordan on it. Where we tell you the first time we met this character and how cute it was. Now, Ashley, I am very curious because... I bet you can guess. Um, I don't know if I can. Uh, <laughs> okay, where did you first meet Hal Jordan? Um... Honestly, I have no idea wait, where wait, I wait, first wait, wait, met Hal You Jordan. said honestly. Do you lie about some of these? Do you <laughs> lie about some of these meet cutes? No. Have you been lying to our students? If I was lying to our students, I'd have better answers than uh, Batman the Animated Series. Well, Hal Jordan has never appears in Batman the Animated Series. Um, Is he in the Justice League He's Animated in the, Series? He is for 10 seconds. Okay, I don't. Because I was like, I honestly, like, I have no idea. Voiced by Adam Baldwin. That's not a plus. Well, like I said, he's in it for 10 seconds. Well, there you go. So um, you cannot say any of those animated Yeah, series. I really honestly don't know because um, I, I, I guess it must have been some Kyle comic I read about. I read. I would assume it'd be Green Lantern Reaper. Um, I guess. I've read like three whole Hal Jordan comics in my life. And, uh, That's like, a low number with how th- how many hundreds of Hal Jordan comics there are. I just mean like with him in the starring role. Sure. Um, because he's not. I th- actually think he's a super overrated Green Lantern. Um, I have no idea because Hal was a character because the first Green Lantern I ever read was Kyle. Yep. Um, and because John was the animated Hal Jordan. Yes, he was. Um, I feel like he's a character I heard a lot about and I knew a lot about, but I honestly can't tell you what my first actual story with him was sure um so there's my real crappy meet cute jason where did you first meet hal jordan well ashley there was a storyline called the return of superman and it was about you can guess it the return of, of superman yeah. no the return of <laughs> superman but how is in the return of superman yeah. because cyborg superman and mongol blow up coast city and how is in it because mongol kicks his butt he has a cast he has his gray hair um now during this comic book in the return of superman uh superman of course had a mullet and i had no idea that coast city had fallen um but my first real big how kind of meet cute is green lantern number zero which is during zero hour mm. it is the kyle rayner versus hal jordan as parallax he's the crazy oh, good main villain it's one of my favorite issues i got uh kyle rayner green lantern creator to sign it for me one time and it was an awesome copy and i still have it but um that's where i know Hal from the return mm-hmm. of superman he basically his fall i never got to read any of the Hal as a hero until after that. Interesting, until Rebirth. Yeah, Hal, Hal Jordan was a villain to me before he was ever a hero, mm-hmm. which I think might inform, although I have been told by several people in my life that if there's any DC Comics character I'm like, it's Hal Jordan, and that's troubling to me because I think Hal Jordan's not a good human being. <laughs> I'm going to assuage you of your fears. You're a much better man than Hal Jordan. Yes, but I've heard, <laughs> in, in terms of being fearless and certain things, like I've had a lot I mean, of people compare me to you to gotta look like Hal Jordan, yeah. um, but you got the beardy thing. Also, the army thing, I think, is people default to yeah, that. Yeah, that's what I think it is, too. You're a much nicer than Hal. Hal's yeah, kind of a so. dick. Yes. Um, and I'm assuming we'll get into that. Yep. Uh, not really. Okay. Not really. We're not going to. Well, then I'll wipe that assumption away. Teach me. Tell me why he's great. All right. Let's go into the history 101 of Hal Jordan. The main meat of the lesson where Professor Jason is going to confirm or deny Hal's legacy. Okay. So first, some publication history. With the insistence of then DC editor Julius Schwartz, uh, they wanted to bring in a new science fiction age of comic books and to revamp the superhero genre at DC. So Hal Jordan was... Yeah, because by the 50s, DC was so dire. Yep. <laughs> now, Hal Jordan was the Silver Age Green Lantern created by John Broom and Gil Kane. His first appearance signaled the reboot of characters away from magic and supernatural fantasy. Those were those stories of the golden age of comics. Mm -hmm. And they replaced them with science fiction based stories. Hal Jordan, of course, appeared along with a newly reimagined Adam, Flash, and Hawkman. Flash, Barry Allen being the first one, of course. Um, This is, of course, the landmark era of comics that many call the beginning of the Silver Age. Yes. Uh, Now, gone was the Green Lantern Alan Scott of the past and now became Hal Jordan, a wielder of a ring of alien origins. Now, let's get to the comic books. Okay. Now, Hal Jordan was born in Coast City to Martin Jordan and Jessica Jordan, and he's the middle child of three children. He lived with his older brother, Jack, 
and a younger brother named Jim. As a young child, he idolized... Why are you laughing at Jim? They have such, like, Jack... Hal and Drew. It's such like old timey 1950s. We're going to the sock hop dude names. He's a 1959 character. I know. I just think it's cute. I think it's quaint. I I like it. It's funny. As a young child, Hal Jordan idolized his father, who was a test pilot who worked for Mm -hmm. Ferris Aircraft. And at a very young age, he got to watch, not pleasantly, of course, Mm. his father, Martin, whose code name was Bishop die in a plane crash right before his eyes. Mm. Now, despite his family's wishes, he followed in his father's footsteps and eventually joined the United States Air Force on his 18th birthday, turning up that very morning outside the Armed Forces Career Center before it even opened. And actually, that, that's kind of the scene that I actually really like. The recruiter comes up and he's like, what do you need, son? And he's like, I'm 18. I'm ready to join. And he's like, welcome to the service. He's like, I've had 12 cups of coffee. Just let me in. <laughs> yeah. Oh, shut up, kid. God, let me open the door. <laughs> Damn like, it. Happy birthday to uh, me. <laughs> um, eventually, though, Hal Jordan, like most things in his life, he screws it up and <laughs> he's thrown out of the Air Force and eventually ended up working for Ferris Air. Mm. Now, Hal Jordan has three distinct origins, and I'm going to briefly tell you about all of them and then tell you about which one I prefer. Okay. In Showcase 22, his very first appearance, the issue begins right out of the gate where he is in the test simulator Mm -hmm. that is rocketing towards a dying alien known as Abin Sur. Mm-hmm. Now, his Green Lantern ring, Abin Sir is a Green Lantern ring, I mean, has identified Hal as an honest man born without fear. And Abin has selected Hal to replace him, telling him that the Green Lantern ring is powerless to anything that is yellow, explaining that that is the reason why Abin Sir was knocked out of the Earth's orbit by a terrible blast of yellow light. Abin dies and Hal becomes the Green Lantern. Now, that, what I just told you, was six pages in that original issue. Wow, that's so Silver Age. It's yep. like, we're going to get right through it all. And the rest of the issue is how actually having several adventures. Um, there's multiple stories in this issue, just like a lot of the old comic yeah, books. Yeah, yeah. The first one is how having an adventure as the new Green Lantern, he's fighting a machine known as a radiation sender that downs aircrafts, <laughs> and he finds the crooks that took down the plane, but... The crooks have a yellow lamp, which they throw <laughs> at Hal Jordan. Shut up. This is, I am not kidding. <laughs> Hal Jordan. Felled by a lamp? Oh, no, no, no. Get ready. Oh. Get ready. So the crook has a yellow lamp. It's uh, a bright yellow lamp. Uh-huh. He throws it at Hal. Uh-huh. Hal gets hit in the head. He goes down on the ground. This explains so much. This allows the criminals to escape. And as they escape... The criminals proclaim, we lamped him. This is, Hal has brain damage. That's why he's the way he is. Well, I just want to uh, say you're welcome for introducing you to your new catchphrase of 2018, we lamped him. Someone put it on a t-shirt. So, uh, <laughs> But this might explain why Hal is a dick, because he gets injured very early on. Yeah, um, that's but- that's. Great. I am not making any of this up. I know you're not. Yep. I love old timey comics. Um, the crooks also escape in a yellow car, and Hal <laughs> catches up to them, and he, <gasps> and he's like, I don't know what to do, and then he grabs the tires. The ultimate foe of Hal Jordan, the yellow brick road. That's right. Da da da. <laughs> um, at the end, he captures them. They go to cr- they go to jail, and Hal shows up to Carol and is like, kiss me, baby. And she doesn't want anything to do with him. (laughs) Because Hal's kind of a creep. Well, and also she's like, I'm your boss. So (laughs) this leaves Hal to pine over how his ring can do everything in the world, but get him Carol and stop yellow lamps (laughs) or cars. That's the end of his first adventure. And he made it past that one book. Wow. Now, Again, there are other adventures in this first tale, but I kind of think it's time to move on. Just to give you a little sneak preview, the second story in that Showcase 22 is an adventure where Hal fights a yellow missile. So I think you can kind of see where his stories are going. I love this. Now let's talk about... Hal versus the lemon tree. Yep, exactly. (laughs) Now let's talk about my preferred Hal Jordan origin. It's called Emerald 
Dawn. Is there a lamp in it? No. Nope. I read Emerald Dawn. There's no lamping. Not. There's no lamping that's in a, the storyline. That's It's lamping time. Yep. It was published in 1989. It was written by Jim Owsley, Keith Giffen, and Gerard Jones. Mm. Now, this was an attempt at a modern post-Crisis on Infinite Earths Green Lantern origin. Now, Ashley, yeah. what is Crisis on Infinite Earths? There were so many Earths, and DC editorial was like, there's so many Earths. So the anti monitor ate them all and pooped out one. Yep. And this was, of course, DC's attempt in 1985 to simplify their universe. Now, yep. I'm going to tell you this origin. I'm going to tell you another origin. And then we're going to go back before yeah, yeah. Crisis on Infinite Earth. But I just, since there are three different origins, I wanted to tell you all about them. This is number two. This is Emerald Dawn. This okay. is my preferred origin. Cool. Now, in this version, Hal tried to follow his father's footsteps, and he worked his way to become a professional pilot. In this version, it is never stated that he joins the Air Force, mm. but I like that he joins the Air Force, so I'm just going to say it happened before the story. Sure. Um, however, he's not a successful pilot, and he's mocked by his peers. <laughs> and after some particularly harsh comments on his failure in his career, as well as, as well as his personal life in a bar, Hal causes an accident with his vehicle, swerving to miss a billboard on the side of the road, which leaves some of his friends seriously wounded. Now, Hal wakes up in the hospital and learns what caused the accident. It's because Hal Jordan was drunk. Oh. Hal Jordan, this origin starts out, Hal Jordan is a drunk driver. Do you are. Yes. You can it never was a go to Canada because it's a felony And there. everybody in the book, the nurses and Carol, there's a whole page of it where they're like... um. I know people that have been killed by mm -hmm. drunk drivers. This is terrible of you. And Carol doesn't even say anything. Carol sees him. He goes, Carol. She slams the door and walks out. I mean, let's be honest. Carol is way too good for Hal. Oh, 100%. Like, even at his best. I'm going to give you a fair warning, though. We're not going to talk about Carol Ferris okay. that much because... You can request a Carol Ferris episode. <laughs> exactly. And she was Star Sapphire for a while, so there's plenty of stuff to do about her, to talk about her, I mean. But in Hal's story, Carol is not really that meaningful to it, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. And I think kind of that shows maybe the arrogance of Hal, but Carol, until I would say the Jeff Johns run, uh -huh. doesn't get the importance that many other ladies of the superheroes, like Iris Allen, mm -hmm. and, Lois, Lane, and Lois Lane. I mean, even Selena Kyle. And even Selena, Carol really never gets that level beyond she's the chick that Green Lantern wants to be with. Yeah, and she's often, especially in the Silver Age, like, socialite lady. She's socialite damsel. Yeah. Yeah. So, hmm, poor Carol. Yeah, exactly. She has a cute hat, though. So, um... Drunk Hal. Yeah, Drunk Hal. Despite being in no condition to work, Hal decided to attend his plane testing job. So he's still <laughs> sort of hungover, and he's injured, he should not be at work. He still went to work. Great. I've been in a car crash. You can't go to yep. work the next day. So he's in the simulator. Great. And suddenly the simulator flies away from Ferris Aircraft's facility. And before Hal could react, he was flying across Coast City and he was in the middle of the desert. Now, we all know this part of the story because it's the same in every version. Mm -hmm. Hal was dragged inside by an unknown force that spoke to him telepathically. And he was greeted by a red alien who tells Hal that he has been chosen to be his successor as the Green Lantern Guardian of Sector 2814. This, of course, is Abin Sur. Yeah. Now, Hal didn't understand the meaning of his message. And before he knew it, the alien died and the mysterious green ring flew from the alien's dead body onto Hal's hand. No, Abin Sur. Yep. And Hal was instantly given the powers of the ring and the same uniform that he had seen the alien wearing suddenly wishing to just not be there how realizes that he can command the ring to perform anything he desired but because he was like i want to get out of here the ring made him fly high into the sky and before he knew it he was several thousand feet above the ground mm. now how keeps using the powers of the ring but he knows that eventually he has to face the law and turn himself into the police for the accident that he caused the in the injuries to his friends mm -hmm. um as he gives in, he has to surrender every valuable object from him, including the ring, and soon he finds himself locked in prison without his Green Lantern ring. 
Soon, the intergalactic villain known as Legion has followed the trail of Abin Sur to planet Earth, where he starts looking for his target. So, a Legion is basically this big, yellow, armored-looking alien. Mm-hmm. Remember? Yep. Yellow. Yeah. Now, when Legion finds out that Abin Sur is dead, he immediately starts seeking the new Green Lantern, and he finds the trail of energy left behind by Hal Jordan's ring. Legion soon attacks the police department, in which Hal is locked, and he kills almost Every police officer inside <laughs> looking for the Green Lantern and demanding for the Green Lantern to show up. In the chaos, Hal is able to walk away from his cell and reach his ring in time to confront Legion. Unfortunately, just as he's about to fight Legion, his ring runs out of power. And Legion grabs Hal and tortures him in order to learn the location of Oa and the Guardians. Now, Ashley, just before we get too far into this lesson, uh-huh. what is Oa and who are the Guardians? Oa is the Green Lantern... Homeworld. I want to say homeworld, but I guess base of operations is probably... Yeah, because none of them are actually from Oa. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Guardians are these weird, tiny, bald, blue elf people aliens. Elf is a great way to describe are, them. They got pointy ears and stuff. Yeah. Um, they kind of look like weird Keebler elves, I guess. Um, <laughs> who? That's not accurate at all. No. Um, who are in charge of the Green Lanterns. Yes, exactly. They call themselves the Guardians of the Universe. Yeah. Uh, so without the Green Lantern energy, how becomes a normal mortal without a costume. Mm-hmm. So Legion can't sense him anymore and he follows the, uh, he, he leaves basically. Yeah. Um, and I know Legion is, you know, he's a Green Lantern villain, he's yellow, whatever. I'm just imagining Dan Stevens from oh, the sure, show. Oh, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> um, so Legion goes to track down all the places that Hal has been because he can sense the residual Green energy. Lantern energy. Oh, that's cool. So he goes to Coast City's hospital and Ferris Aircraft, and he starts terrorizing them. Now, this becomes problematic with the hospital because, again, remember at the beginning of the story, Hal injured several of his friends. So they're all there recovering. They're all at the mm-hmm. hospital, and now Hal causes them to be injured a second time. Time, mm, not very heroic. And all the people that he left it, he left down at Ferris mm-hmm. Aircraft. They are also hurt by Hal a second time. Now, when Hal learns the bad news, he realizes that he caused it all. He realizes it's all his fault. So he runs back to the ship of Alban Sir, mm-hmm. where he finds the ring, and he finds a green lantern there and he learns how to charge the ring. Yes, because they are mm-hmm. not forever powerful. Yep. Once the ring is charged, Hal can access the memory database of the ring and learns the background of Aubin Sir, of course the alien, and he learns the origin of Legion, the yellow monster who attacked him. Hal confronts Legion once again and this time he uses the reactor of Aubin Sir's ship to create a nuclear explosion in the desert that he hopes would destroy Legion. Now, Hal survives the explosion thanks to the ring, which protects him. And then he soon asks the ring to take him to meet another Green Lantern. The ring suddenly flies him into space <laughs> and introduces him to Tomar Ray. I like Tomar Ray. He is sort the of a fish bird. He's a fish bird looking. A, uh, he's from Sector 2813, I believe, the sector right over. I don't know. Um, a veteran Green Lantern who explains his current situation to the rookie Hal Jordan. They are soon both summoned to Oa, the headquarters of the Green Lanterns. And Hal is introduced to Kilowog. Who's Kilowog? He's a big um, pig dog looking guy. Yep. He's kind of pink. He likes to say poozer. He's huge and he's in charge of training the new yep. recruits. He's amazing. He's the, drill, he's the drill sergeant of the Green Lanterns. Yes. Yep. Uh, you'll see him in the mm-hmm. amazing movie yep. um, and the even better animated series. Now during Hal's training with Kilowog, Oa is breached for the first time in centuries and every Green Lantern including Hal confronts Legion. And then we finally learn the origin of Legion. Apparently in the ancient times, the Green Lantern Corps came across the planet Tick Tick in Space <laughs> Sector 407, which was home to an aggressive insectile race. After conquering their own planet, this ex- insectile, uh, excuse me, insectile race began to spread to the rest of the galaxy, at which point the Guardians of the Universe decided to take action, sending the Green Lanterns to beat back the Tick Tick and seal off their planet. Unable to leave their planet, the Tick Tick quickly expended their food supply and began to die out. And realizing that they were going to go extinct, they put their minds together into a new invention, the Soul Jar, which in they put all of their memories, all of their minds into a sort of a hive mind. And they built that hive mind a body, mm-hmm. calling it Legion. Legion. Uh, it's I, actually I, a biblical reference. Yep, I like the villain of Legion. Yeah, Legion's cool. 
Now, Hal Jordan attacked and dragged Legion across a muddy area of Oa, which covered Legion with mud, which allowed the Green Lanterns to attack Legion. Hal decided to leave him alive, but he removed Legion's armor, which turned out to actually be a giant mistake as the bean inside started growing and consuming everything on the planet at an alarming rate. The Guardians realized that Legion was going to consume all of Oa, and they commanded the Green Lanterns to basically leave the planet behind. Mm-hmm. That was their big plan. Let's just go! Yeah. There's other planets? Yep. <laughs> However, Hal Jordan refused, and he remembered Abin Sur's word about Green Lantern energy being the ultimate power. So he recalled that the Green Lanterns take their energies from the central power battery of Oa, which is just like mm-hmm. just a giant Green Lantern in the center of the planet. Yeah, um, he, that's a good description. Yep, he dived into it, emerging as a being of pure willpower energy, and using this power, Hal Jordan was able to create a vacuum that took out Legion out of Oa and into space. And the Guardians were flummoxed by this. They didn't understand how any Green Lantern could do this. They were like, this is impossible. Mm-hmm. No Green Lantern can do this. And because of this, the Green Lantern, the Guardians, excuse me, decided that Hal should return to Earth and his training was basically over. If he could do that great feat, no more training. Back on Earth, Hal turned himself into the authorities and was arrested for the crimes he committed before becoming a Green Lantern. And when he was finally released from his jail time, Carol Ferris gave him his job back and he was eventually promoted to pilot. Boy, he's lucky. Yep. Now, there is a lot of arrogance in that run of Hal, mm-hmm. but what do you think about that expanded origin for Hal Jordan where he sort of like has to confront these mistakes and like he is his own worst enemy? I do. I do appreciate that. And I think... There's been a lot of human Green Lanterns, a lot of Earth-based Green Lanterns. Um, and the one thing that I do appreciate about them is they, I think they all do a good job at illustrating how willpower can manifest in different people. Sure. Hal's definitely brushes up against arrogance. However, with the incident on Oa, you get to see where that level of arrogance, which some people would just uh, classify as confidence, you get to see the pros in that. Because I don't know if Kyle Rayner would have done that. You know, I don't know if Simon Baz would have done that. Just be like, well, I'm going to dive into this battery and it'll be fine. You know, like that's a pretty strong move to pull. Yes. Um, And I like that Hal, because he's kind of ridiculous, has to do this ridiculous thing to re- kind of realize how to be a better human. I like it because it shows his will. Mm-hmm. That it, And I like the idea of starting him as a screw up because a lot of times a lot they of- do that with Kyle too. Yeah, a lot of Hal storylines start off where he's like suave ladies man. Mm-hmm. And to me, it's like if he's already at the top, he has nothing to work for. Exactly. So I like this idea that like he's not a pilot. I, I think it was a bold choice- to do a drunk driving incident. I agree. As a hero origin. I definitely agree. Yes. To have him overcome such a huge mm-hmm. obstacle to, to begin with. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Cool, cool. Now, Jeff Johns rebooted the Hal Jordan origin again in his storyline called Secret Origin, tying it heavily into the Blackest Night crossover run. The main difference with his is that Atrocitus is the reason why Abin Sur crashes on Earth. Now, the, Ashley, the, do you know who Atrocitus is? Yeah, he's the big evil leader of the Red Lanterns. Yes, exactly. He's got a cool cat. Um, a Basically, just to give you more about Atrocitus, when the rogue manhunters rampage through Sector 666... Hey, uh, imagine that. Yep. <laughs> Atros was one of the only five beings to survive, uh, escape death, having been forced to witness his own wife and daughters killed by rampaging robots. He renamed himself Atrocitus, and him and four other survivors made a terrorist group called the Five Inversions, bent on the destruction of the Guardians of the Universe. Eventually, the Guardians imprisoned them on his planet, Yismolt. Cool. So, uh, also in the story, Sinestro travels to Earth to help Hal defeat Atrocitus. Black Hand is there, but um, it's basically the same kind of story. But I prefer Emerald Dawn, the Emerald Dawn version of the story. Cool. That is fair. So, something else that I prefer is sleeping. Ooh. Yes. And uh, speaking of sleeping on a good mattress, we all like that, right? Definitely. And we can get that thanks to today's sponsor, Lisa. That's L E E S A. Now, Lisa is an innovative direct consumer online mattress brand. And that means they ship mattresses straight to your house in a super cool compressed box. You don't go outside of your home to shop for a mattress. Let mattress companies send the mattress to you. That's yeah. the way to do it. Yeah. Uh, Lisa also plants one tree for every mattress sold and donates <gasps> 1% of each employee's time to volunteer for local causes. So your money nice. isn't going to an evil corporation. It's going to a m- company that cares about the earth, and they also care about how you sleep. 
Uh, these mattresses are available in the U.S., U.K., Canada, and Germany. And uh, we've heard that future sites will also include the Green Lantern homeworld of OA. Nice. So you can get $100 off the Lisa mattress using the code. Go to lisa.com slash geekhistory. That's G-E-E-K-H-I-S-T-O-R-Y. And when they ask you for a promo code, you type in Geek History. That's because you're listening to Geek History Lesson Podcast. You found this from Geek History Lesson Podcast. Uh, you can try this mattress in your own home for 100 nights risk fee with free shipping. Always free shipping. So remember, $100 off any Lisa mattress using going to the URL lisa.com slash geekhistory and using the promo code Geek. History. It's pretty less. It's pretty easy. Geek yeah. History. Geek History. Yeah. Yeah, Geek History. Yeah. Go to Lisa.com. Geek History. I'm not even saying the end. I'm not saying Tori anymore. <laughs> All right, let's go back to Hal Jordan. Thank, okay. Thank you so much, Lisa, for sponsoring this thank episode. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, now, like every other Silver Age DC character, a lot of Hal Jordan's adventures are interchangeable. Fight, sure. Fight the bad guy. Repeat. Uh-huh. Fight the bad guy. Throw repeat. him in jail. Maybe they so, break out a couple issues yeah, later. Yeah, we're, we're sort of going to skip ahead a little bit. Um, so Hal Jordan, of course, helped to found the Justice League, mm-hmm. uh, but nothing with Hal Jordan really changed until the 1970s. Okay. Uh, by the 1970s, some new writers were going to take over the Green Lantern, and they basically changed it forever. What? When Green Arrow was forced into Green Lantern's book, and they <gasps> became the hard-traveling hard traveling hero. I feel like they need like a country song introduction. The hard-traveling hero. Yeah, with like some plucky banjo. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Hard traveling heroes. I know they were bam, bam, only bam. paired up because it was Green Lantern and Green Arrow, but these stories are great. They actually were only paired up because Green Lantern's title was uh, doing badly in the sales, and they thought that making it a team up book would make it sell better. It it did. It actually didn't. <laughs> I know, but the, the story, book was canceled. Uh, I know, but it's it's funny because it is one of those runs it that made it last like, for another ten issues. I uh, it did, <laughs> but this run is now well liked. Yes, and it is. It's really good. Mm-hmm. Now, starting with issue number 76, Dennis O'Neill took over scripting and Neil Adams became the series artist. In an introduction of a 1983 trade paperback reprinting of this run, O'Neill explained that the reason for this run became when he thought maybe he could represent his own political beliefs in comics and take on social issues of the late 60s and early 70s. So O'Neill devised the idea of portraying Hal Jordan Basically, as an intergalactic law enforcement officer, as an establishment gra- against, excuse me, against the establishment gradualist liberal figure, Oliver Queen, who O'Neill had characterized as a lusty, outspoken anarchist who would stand in for the counterculture movement. So whenever people tell you that comics aren't political and shouldn't be, you can point them to this run. We're going to talk some more about that in just a second. <laughs> so the stories tackled questions of power, racism, sexism, exploitation, and they actually remain in many comic experts' minds these are the first socially conscious superhero stories of all time. Mm. Um, and issue 76 contains a very famous scene when an African-American man confronts Green Lantern. And here's the basic story of that issue. Okay. It begins with Green Lantern saving an overweight guy from being publicly beaten to death by some kids in the street. All the Queen, Green Arrow, choose Hal out for saving the guy because you find out that that guy that he saved is a slum lord who doesn't fix up the building that he owns. And he's been taking the inhabitants' money and using it to buy himself nice things. So his residents are angry. When Green Lantern tries to insist that that doesn't mean that they were right to beat him up and that he's got a job to do, Green Arrow basically gets up in his grill and gets on his case. Then an African man, or African American man, excuse me, walks up to Green Lantern and says one of the most famous lines in comic books. He says, and I quote, I've been reading about you, how you work for the blue skins, and how on our planet you helped some orange skins. And you've done considerable work for the purple skins. Only there's skins you never bothered with. The black skins. I want to know how come. Answer me that, Green Lantern. Now, Ashley, Mm -hmm. it's this question with that. How much do you think should comics deal with social issues? Is there a point where it's too far? Or was this too far for these hard traveling heroes, or was it just a simpler time? I would just love to hear your opinions about all of that. You know? I have so many opinions about this. I a thousand percent think that comics should always deal with social issues because 
Comics are modern North American myths and myths are morality tales, meaning that they deal with moral issues. That's biblical. That's Greek. That's Egyptian. That's everything that Norse, everything that we think is fascinating. Comics tread that same ground. Also, I would argue that the hard traveling heroes are not the first political comics. What do you think there? I mean, I, I'm definitely not up and up on all the earliest comics ever, but I mean, as far as superhero comics goes, it's got to be Superman. Um, Because Superman, I'll tell you why, it might not be explicitly sure. political, but Superman, and this is something that I've heard you say, Superman always represents the underrepresented. Yeah. Superman always represents the little guy, the, the person who needs help the most. Superman, Batman's the hero of the 1%. He is. He's a billionaire. And that's like diamonds and art. Like, that's real sexy, but it's not altruism and Mm -hmm. it's not heroism. It's vigilantism, which like, that's fun. And he's got a dope costume and all that. But Superman and and he's an immigrant. I think Superman, I I would agree with you that I think Superman is, especially early action comics, Mm -hmm. are some of the very first socially conscious comic books. But I think they did it unconsciously. And I I think this is mm -hmm. the first time that they intentionally... I don't know if they did it unconsciously, but I don't think they went into writing a Superman comic thinking, we're going to come here with a message. Yes. But I think that that's baked into who those creators were and what they were creating. Um, But I think this is probably, yeah, the first comic book series at this level that that did decide that they were going to deal with social issues. And I think... I even think that this scene and what you read to us, I think that scene could exist today. And I think mm-hmm. it's still relevant. I don't think it crosses a line in the slightest. I've read the Lo- the Superman issue where Lois Lane turns into an African-American lady and goes and hangs out in a black neighborhood. That's a troubling issue by modern standards. Yeah. I think that speech to Hal is is very relevant and very eloquent. Mm-hmm. And I agree with you because you hear the statement, especially a lot, I would say, on modern social mm-hmm. media of... You know, like, oh, I don't want politics. I, I don't want politics in my entertainment. Yeah. Like, I just want entertainment. And I would, I say to that statement every single time, if you just want entertainment, then that just says that you want a story where two characters just beat themselves up. Mm-hmm. There's no explanation for why they're doing it. We don't get to hear either side of why these two men are fighting. You just want to see two people beat each other up then then go to a boxing match then go to a boxing match that's what i say if you don't but but to me the most powerful stories do have messages in them mm-hmm. and i would argue the best example is star trek mm-hmm. star trek the original series has so many deep issues baked into these aliens mm-hmm. these metaphors these allegories they're so amazing and i have never heard anybody call star trek political which is funny because it's the most political show you've ever Absolutely. seen. Absolutely. I would also argue that just because at face value, like, Hard Traveling Heroes is very obviously political. Sure. Um, and there are books, uh, there's contemporary, even non big too, like Black is a comic that's very obviously political right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, a great book. You should definitely check it out. Um, but just because you can't recognize it doesn't mean it's not political. You want to tell me that Star Wars is not political, that there's not undertones of colonization in all of that, that we're not talking about... Um, uh, a totalitarian government that there aren't overtures to uh, Nazis in it. Like there are. it's everywhere, especially in superhero and sci-fi. I mean, you can pick anything you want. Voltron just dropped a new season. That's political. Mm-hmm. And just because you don't recognize it doesn't mean it's not there. I think you'd be hard pressed. You'd probably have to go to children's entertainment, like PJ masks for little kids, children's entertainment to find something that doesn't have a message baked into it. You know, it's interesting though, but I would argue that, I'll, you'd be surprised how much of children's television has political messages. I, I mean, it. like stuff made for like three year olds. Or you know, yeah, yeah. I don't. Exactly. I don't necessarily mean. Yeah, Thomas the Tank, 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 <laughs> tank Engine is that right? Like that. I think Ringo's pretty pure on there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, who would have thought this? The Hal Jordan episode was the one we we're going to bring this up on. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, so Hal went on a road trip with fellow hero Green Arrow, whose personality couldn't be more different than Hal's. Hal eventually settled for a time in Evergreen City, Washington, and it was during this time that the Guardians assigned a backup Green Lantern to Sector Two Eight One Four named John Stewart, Woo! and they also depowered Hal's ring. Eventually, it was repowered, of course. After Guy Gardner's presumed death, Hal met and fell in love with psychic Carrie Limbo. However, once Guy returned from the dead, Carrie left Hal at the altar to take care of the comatose gardener and Hal went back to his job at Ferris Aircraft. Really? I didn't know any of that. That's wild. It's pretty silly and stupid. Can you believe somebody left Hal for Guy? That's right. Ooh, that's gotta hurt. 
hey, if you love a ginger, you love a ginger. That's yeah, all I'm Guy, Guy Gardner is also a character we have a lot of requests for. Next, we're going to move into a storyline called Tales of the Green Lantern. Now, from here, I'm going to bring up storylines that directly affect how. Cool. Uh, now, Tales of the Green Lantern is a three-issue miniseries. It follows the battle between Crona and Hal Jordan. And in this series, Hal meets Arisia. For the first time. Now, Ashley, who is Arisia? She's a lady Green Lantern who's got orange skin and yellow hair and a really skimpy costume and kisses Hal sometimes. Yep. I like her a lot. Now, when she shows up, she doesn't have a skimpy costume. She has a costume that looks exactly like Hal's. Now, Arisia... Her most famous costume is a skimpy yeah, costume. Is Arisia Rab was originally from the planet Graxos... Four. Her father, Fentara, also served as the Green Lantern of Sector 2815, so mm-hmm. she's neighboring to Hal. Eventually, Arisia assumed the role of Green Lantern in her sector as a teenager. She was like 14 years old, I believe. She's like unequivocally underage. Now, <laughs> Hal and her have a romance, and it becomes even more troubling when in this storyline, her first appearance, um, he calls her little sister. <laughs> For I've three seen, issues. I've seen these panels brought up in a lot of articles that are like, is Hal Jordan a dick? Question mark. Yep. <laughs> now, this tale starts with the calling of all 3,000 Green Lanterns uh, uh, back home by the Guardians. Mm. The Lanterns are reunited and they learn that their universe is being threatened by Krona. Now, Krona is a former guardian of the universe. Basically, Krona wanted to see the beginning of the universe. There was a law that the Guardians couldn't do. And he saw something that was so terrible that it breaks evil and spreads evil into the universe and the Guardians as punishment disembody him and send him out into the universe as energy. Now, Krona comes back full-bodied and he attacks the Green Lanterns. And Krona kills a Guardian and eventually we learn that Krona came back because of Necron. Mm. Now, Ashley, do you know who Necron is? Outside of being a Green Lantern villain that I think can raise the dead? Has something to do with the dead? Necron is a fictional embodiment of... I don't of, really know is the answer. Necron is a fictional embodiment of death. Oh, there you go. I kind of nailed it. it. <laughs> um, now, to give you an idea, after the Owen sci- scientist Krona was sentenced to banishment as pure energy, the energy somehow reached Necron's realm, and a rift opened between the dimensions due to the paradox of an immortal now being in the realm of the dead, because mm. Krona was a guardian of the universe. Um, you know, uh, a Krona also did his thing so long ago that that's when the Guardians actually looked like human beings. They weren't short in sure. these little floaty guys that floated all the time. Yeah. That's supposed to be their more evolved form. Woof. Yep. Uh, desire- also, there's always a Guardian who is dying. Like, always one of them is dying. No. Yeah. Don't know what you're referring to at all. Uh, not true at all. Uh, desiring the living world he is now able to see, uh, but being too large to pass through it, Necron recreates Krona as an undead being of enormous power instead. Do you see any allusion to Blackest Night coming through this, the mm-hmm. event that we'll cover later on? Maybe. Um, given an army of similarly restored spirits, Krona and his minions kill several Guardians and Green Lanterns while destroying the central power battery to prevent the, laterns, the Lanterns from recharging their power rings. Although his attack is powerful enough to shatter the morale of the Green Lantern Corps, Hal Jordan manages to inspire and rally his favorite lanterns, his fellow lanterns, excuse me, into attacking Krona with the charge still left in their rings. Necron is defeated when Jordan enters the realm of the dead and incites the spirits of the recently killed lanterns to rebel against Necron. This distraction undercuts Krona's power supplied by the dead beings, thus giving the Guardians enough time to banish Krona into the dead realm and close the rift with Jordan still trapped inside. Thankfully, though, a certain dead Green Lantern shows up and helps Hal Jordan escape the realm of the dead. One of my favorite Green Lanterns of all time, Abin Sir. Yeah. The guy who gave Hal Jordan. He's the one. The spirit of Abin Sir allows Hal to escape. Um, because Hal Jordan escapes from the realm of the dead, the Guardians offer Jordan the leadership of the entire Green Lantern Corps, but he turns it down. I feel like this is the story of Hal does a crazy thing, somehow survives, and the Guardians are like, damn, I guess you're the best. Well, the reason why I want to talk about Tales of the Green Lantern Corps is because you're going to see a lot of similarities to that when we eventually talk about Blackest Night. Yeah. Okay. So, And there's a lot. You can tell that Jeff Johns was very inspired by Tales of the Green Lantern Corps. Cool. So next we're going to go to a story called Ganthet's Tale that's just going to kind of perform that... Um, 
Hal Jordan was becoming um, more and more distrustful of the Guardians of the Universe, mm-hmm. which is going to lead into eventual action. And uh, he also gets some gray hair on the storyline. So there you go. Um, Ganthet tells the story of the Guardians of the Universe in their early days in the storyline. And we learn that the Malthusians, who are the Guardians of the Universe, were an advanced race who used their intelligence and powers to study nature. They were forbidden knowledge of only one thing, the origin of the universe. Why? Who the hell Reasons. Knows? Yeah, comic book reasons. Unfortunately, one guardian, Krona, we heard of him, became obsessed with observing the event, and he created a device that allowed him to view the creation of the universe. He saw a hand setting the universe's creation into motion. And when he attempts to see the face to whom the hand belongs, a bolt of cosmic force shattered his device, and from Krona's mistake came the force of evil into the universe. Of course... This is a lie, as we find out in the storyline. Mm. Um, now, Hal Jordan, during the storyline, he wakes to find Ganthet as a door, claiming that he needs Hal Jordan to rescue an entire race. Together, as they fly into outer space, Ganthet explains that um, what happened with Krona is that someone is trying to recreate Krona's mistake. And instead of using the image of a young universe as a reflector onto the truth about the Maltusians, this is what we learn. Mm. We learn that the Maltusians were a violent people. They're not godlike, although they claim to be in legend. And Gathan explains that the origin story that all Greenlanders know is a fabrication by the Guardians to mask their most vulnerable moments of from enemies who would attack with time. Unfortunately, Krona's crime was not unleashing evil into the world. But the effects of his efforts to see the face of the giant crater caused him to connect the end of the universe with its beginning. And the entropy from it drained nearly one billion years of potential energy from the beginning of time or the beginning of this universe. Basically taking one billion years away from the lifespan of this universe. Um, after this adventure, Hal Jordan has reservations about the trustworthiness of the Guardians, uh, especially since he learned that some of their legends are based on lies. Mm-hmm. Hal would later use this knowledge of the beginning and end of the universe in an event called Zero Hour, which we'll learn about later. Okay. Um, and then Superman dies. How did Superman die, Ashley? He fought Doomsday. Yep, they basically punched each other to death. Yeah. Uh, and then there were four Supermen, correct? Yes. Who are the four Supermen? Cyborg, Superman. Yep. Superboy with the fade cut. Yeah. Um, the Eradicator. Yes. And... The most, the bestest one. Oh, uh, uh, Steel. Yes, yeah, I was going to say Electric Superman, and I was like, no. John Henry Irons. Yes. Now, before we get to the storyline, we need to go to some quick publishing history. Okay. In the early 1990s, DC tried to relaunch the Green Lantern comic under Gerard Jones. Hal Jordan was rescued from his Action Comics Weekly days where he was just a supporting character. He was. He was a supporting character in Action Comics Weekly. He didn't even have his own title. And so they gave him his own title, his own solo series. Uh, However, his sales remains very low. And it looked like Green Lantern would have to be canceled again. Instead, DC ran the infamous, the infamous, excuse me, Emerald Twilight story arc written by Ron Mars with the idea to introduce a new Green Lantern into the solo title to rescue the book. Mm -hmm. And guess what? That Green Lantern is called Kyle Rayner and it worked. Because it's good. It worked. Um, So just to let you know, that happens. Emerald Twilight begins in, I think, issue 48 of Green Lantern, the second solo series of Hal Jordan. Mm -hmm. Um, Hal Jordan's title was going to be canceled less than two years or less than 40, um, excuse me, less than four years. Uh, when, you, when you think about how big Hal Jordan has become, that's kind of surprising. It is, yeah. So, uh, In that storyline, Jordan's hometown, Coast City, was destroyed by the cyborg Superman, remember him, and the alien warlord Mongol in order to turn it into something called Engine City, a replacement for War World. While the two were beaten, Hal could not accept the fact that his city was gone. So Hal used his ring to create the constructs of the entire people of Coast City. 
You can actually find some really cool art of that yep. online. One of the contracts he created took the form of his dead father, in fact. Mm. Uh, because Hal only wanted to see his father being proud of him instead of just saying how great his brothers Jack and Jim were. His father told him how Hal's brothers had done something with their lives while Hal's head was in the clouds. And even when Hal became a hero, his father mocked him at how he wasn't even to save Coast City. Now, here's the weird thing about this. This construct is is created by Hal's mind. Hal's mind is telling Hal that he sucks. Well, <laughs> I guess that tells you something about Hal yeah. Jordan. <laughs> um, Hal focuses willpower again, and he, again, like I said, he created the entire Coast City, creates all the people, he makes it a living city, and eventually all of Coast City disappears because Hal runs out of power. Yeah. The Guardians then appear and basically say, Hal Jordan, you're doing something bad. We're going to slap you on the wrist. And Hal asks them for more power, but the Guardians of the uh, Green Lanterns universe, the Guardians of the excuse me, refuse to give Hal more power. Being consumed with fear, uh, this left Hal vulnerable to Parallax, the spirit embodiment of fear. During this, Hal wants to use his ring for personal needs. He wants to bring the people back. Mm -hmm. The Guardians say no. So he then drains the energy from the Guardians' projection because they were talking to him through hologram Mm -hmm. and he travels to Oa. How, under this influence of Parallax, loses his senses, murders several other core members including Tomar II, Baduka, Kihan, Liara, Graf Toran, Creon, and Jack T. Chance, Claiming the Guardians made him a slave and stole the power rings of the Lanterns defeated. This leads to the very famous cover where Hal Jordan has a Green Lantern ring on every single uh, hand. That's a really cool cover. He even went on to reluctantly kill Kilowog. No. He reached Oa where he battled Sinestro, who was let free of his prison by the Guardians, and Hal removed his other rings in order to face Sinestro in a fair fight. The battle ended with Hal's victory by snapping Sinestro's neck and led to the death of Sinestro at the time, claiming it was something Hal should have done a long time ago. Hal claims he crossed the line and he can never go back. And when the Guardians claim he will be punished, Hal accuses them for not being there to give him the power that he only wanted to use to give to make his normal life come back. Uh, he kills every one of the Guardians, uh, except for Ganthet, and he abandons his Green Lantern ring, and he starts to absorb the emerald energies of the main central power battery, destroying the battery along with every one of the remaining Green Lantern core. Ganthet runs away from this. He retrieves Hal's fallen ring and goes to Earth to find a person who, be- who could become the new and last Green Lantern. And he encounters the man called Kyle Rayner in an alleyway behind a bar. Mm-hmm. Why he's, he's peeing behind the bar. Uh, and gives him Hal's ring and disappears. He's like, you're good enough. Yep. Hal finally comes out of this giant energy vortex, absorbing all of the energy of the central power battery inside his body with a brand new kick-ass costume designed by Daryl Banks, and he becomes known as the villain Parallax. And that's the end of part one of our Hal Jordan what? lesson. We're gonna follow part the rest one. of Yeah, we're gonna follow the rest of Hal Jordan's career next week because there's so much of it. There's too much of it. There's too much how. Mm. Too much how, I say. Uh, so next would be our recommended reading, but we're going to save that for next episode. You can find all of our recommended reading at geekishlesson.com slash recommended reading. Uh, we're going to save all the rest of the Hal Jordan talk for another episode. But So let's go straight into our Geekish Lesson honor roll. Yeah. Uh, Ashley, let's talk about that. What is that? Well, the honor roll is real easy to get on, actually. You don't even have to work that hard. You go over to iTunes, you give us a five-star review, and we'll read whatever you write. Yes, yeah, since we're moving all the uh, uh, in stuff of the Hal Jordan episode into Hal Jordan part two. I thought we could add two people. What? To get here's Lynn on a roll. I think that's only fair. Uh, so there we're going to be receiving keys to the teacher's lounge uh, soon. Enjoy uh, your bagels. The first five star review comes from Spider UK who says, listening to these episodes, new or old, are the best part of my day. Oh, thanks, man. Oh, thank you. Uh, when I was first listening almost two years ago now, I had just sunk into a small depression for a period. The kind and warm voices and geek-tacular teachings of Ashley and Jason were more than enough to get me socializing again and have a successful senior year. These two are phenomenal hosts, always producing some of the best content anyone can find online. Spider UK, I'm so glad that we could help you, and I'm so glad that you had a great senior year. Yeah, so, I'm glad uh, that we could be your buddy for yeah. that. Um, speaking of somebody else who left us a five-star review, Eric Mc, McNamee 
Eric McNamee said, me and my lady love. Listen and get into deep, thoughtful superhero-based discussions because of this podcast, and it has improved our car rides tenfold. Thank you nice. both. Nice. Um, oh, how bad were their car rides before? <laughs> I don't know. Oh. <laughs> uh, so Spider UK and Eric McNamee, thank you so much for joining the uh, Geek Air Lesson Honor Roll. If you want to be like these two awesome students and eat bagels in our teacher's lounge because you're on the Honor Roll, just go over to iTunes and leave us a five-star review, and it's how you're going to help us on iTunes and how you can help yourself and get we'll read anything you write. Yeah. Leave us five stars. Yeah. Uh, also, if you'd like to join the Hall of Justice and become a super friend and support the show, then head on over to patreon.com slash Jawan, mm-hmm. where you can listen to our bonus Geek History Lesson extra podcast episodes and help support the Geek History Lesson podcast from never going away like Hal Jordan did. Uh, this <laughs> we- this weekend, this week, excuse me, not weekend, or if you want to listen to it on the weekend, that's totally fine. Um, the extra episode will be about, is Hal Jordan really the greatest Green Lantern? Oh, that would be interesting. That. Yeah, it should be an interesting conversation. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. And you can suggest future lessons like uh, Chaim Steinberg and Tobias, Ethan Isaiah Mackey, John Paul Roca, Dixon Bowley, and Cameron. Is that yeah. his name? Cameron, Cameron. from Fredericton. Uh, where can they do that? Oh, you can do that at geekhistorylesson.com, facebook.com slash geekhistorylesson, or on Twitter at GHL Podcast. There's like a thousand ways to contact us in all of those places. Yep. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter. For me, it's at Jawin, J-A-W-I-I-N. For Ashley, it's at Ashley V. Robinson. And the podcast, you can be found at GHL Podcast. And also, guys, we do tons of videos over at youtube.com slash Jawin. So uh, go ahead over there, too, as well. And then you do the thing over there. Um, Ashley. Mm. Um so how Jordan's now parallax? Yeah, I've this heard is our that. this is our thing to do a final little bit of discussion to see if people stick hashtag stick around. Yeah, or stick up, stuck up. I don't remember what it is. Stick up, how? Hashtag stick around. If you're listening to this end part, go to Twitter. Hashtag stick around. Um, Ashley, mm. how? Um, he's a villain now. Mm. Um, any insights about how? What What you learn about how from this part one? What did I learn about how? Um, I learned that someone threw a lamp at him. Yep, we lamped him. I'll never get over that. We That's lamped like, him. That's like, It's a funny, look. it's a funny, oh, here's, okay, so I'm going to describe this for you again. So the guy holds up a lamp, right? And you is can, it painted yellow or is just the light yellow? The okay lamp. you don't remember. The lamp is painted yellow. Okay. So the crook is, he's bald, he kind of looks like Luther. He's holding up the lamp in the foreground, mm. Hal is in the background, the guy throws the lamp. The next panel is the guy throws the lamp. How can see it coming at him? And he like blasts his energy at him. And he's like, oh, no, the lamp is getting closer. And then the third panel is he gets smacked with it. Again, and he existed for longer than just this one issue. Yep. Um, the gold and the silver age of comics are like awesomely dumb by modern standards. Because, by modern because standards. Because comics have changed a lot. And we don't get to what we have now without those things. That's one of my favorite things I've ever heard. We lamped it's him. It's amazing. Yeah. Should that be a t-shirt? I think I said it when it happened. It should be a t-shirt. We lamped him. Let us know uh, on Twitter if you would like a we lamped him, uh, you know. I just keep thinking of like, t-shirt. instead of it's clobbering time, like it's lamping time. It's lamping time? Yeah. I like that. It's lamping time. <laughs> yeah, sure. Why the hell not? Just put it all on there. It's lamping time. Uh, yeah, so there you go. Lamping. Here's your new phrase. That's what I learned. Uh, thank you so much for listening to this episode of Geek Cares Lesson. I am Jason Emerald Inman. I am Ashley Victoria Robinson. And uh, Professor Lantern, why don't you dismiss the class? Class is now dismissed. <laughs>